I'm going to introduce us a little bit. As you can see, there are three names. Uh, there were three names, but only two people here. Come to them in a minute. Um, introducing myself, I've been doing free software since before it was named open source. All those dates are when I officially started as a developer, not as a user. And yeah, I'm still doing it, so that means it's 23 years now. The idea for this presentation came up when Jim and I talked at scale. And he was about, I told him about this customer of ours and he said, well, that's interesting. That should attract people that people would like to hear about it. And I figured, okay, let's do it. I put the presentation in for the CFP and then figured out, hmm, I really don't touch the system myself. So as soon as technical questions come up that are a little deeper in de into detail, I'm kind of lost. So <clears throat> the idea was to bring Bernd, uh, our technical lead on Postgres, because he's leading the team working on that customer. Unfortunately, he got sick and couldn't travel. So um, we, had to, um, we had to change plans. He's still listed there, but I brought Julian with me instead, who's working on that team, so he knows as much about the system as does Bernd. Um, you can see he doesn't work for us as long as Bernd does, but most of his work, a lot of his work is on exactly that customer system, which, by the way, I'm not allowed to name. Sorry about that. Um, this is just introduction about the company. I'm going to skip that one completely. Coming back to the, the original source of that special customer situation. You see here, this is uh, admittedly already 10 years old, but numbers still hold true. Um, total cost of ownership for running computer systems. And as you can see, um, the biggest cost is staff. But a lot of people think about reducing the total cost of ownership, think about reducing licenses, right? But licenses is not all. It's, as, a, as you see, it's a small part, actually. And the, the worst thing I've heard was um, a company, well, actually it was a government uh, unit, they had more than 90% of their whole IT budget was already fixed for salaries and maintenance costs. There's not much left. So that brings us to this customer of ours. Just picture a company Nowadays we speak of e-commerce, but way back when, mail order, home shopping, whatever you call it, um, they started with mail order. Nowadays it's online, TV channel, I don't know. Um, but you're in a situation where you face competition from traditional re uh, retailers, but also from other and larger uh, e-commerce systems. In particular, when you're in an area where also smaller price things are, there's a lot of cost pressure. Get the pressure, the cost down. And you need a great bit of performance, right? Because you're going to sell, and you're trying to sell a lot of stuff. So they came up with the idea of um, getting it all on power. Actually, I don't know why, because that was before we started working with them. Maybe it's just historical, but anyway, um, they also came up with the idea of using Postgres. And at that point, you're in the position where you say, okay. Which one came first? Was it that the order power? They already had power. So I assume power was the historical one they were using. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, they, they use both operating systems, right? AIX and Linux. Which is right now. Way back when, it was just AIX. Okay, okay. So, as you can see, the, the, the first question then is, where do I get my Postgres? It's not just about having it running. I need updates and everything. I don't want to do my configure, make, make, install stuff every time and build my own team for that. And besides, you might need some professional help with, the, with one or the other thing. So, <clears throat> that's where we came into play which is exactly where I leave the stage.
to have him talk to you about the technical details. Can you hear me? That seems to work. Um, hi. So I'm Julian. I think Michael has introduced me as uh, fairly good as well already. Um, so this customer we're talking about has been around since the early 90s. And um, this is one of the reasons why Michael doesn't, doesn't recall the times, what, uh, doesn't recall what they did when they started, because you know this is like 20 years ago. Um, but starting in the early 90s, they were selling products to their customers via, uh, via brochures or tailor shopping or whatever. And um, they very quickly had to adopt to e-commerce because of, this, is, this is exactly the area where you want to be in, um, especially for this, this kind of workflow. Um, so if you're starting to use IT on the bigger scale in the early 90s, you know, this is like the dark ages of IT, you know. Um, things were horrible back then, and you had to use whatever came to be, uh, uh, was available. So, um, of course, the infrastructure was, was growing and growing until they reached, what, uh, reached their potential. Um, but eventually, they decided, they, had to change a uh, few parts, had to, had to adapt. And uh, in, uh, in, I think, 2005, they changed to PostgreSQL and haven't let go since. So, oops, uh, um, yeah, maybe one thing about historically growing, uh, we're still using like OS2 Ecom station with rec scripts to connect to the Postgres server. Um, this is so old, most people don't even know it. And I only know it because this very customer uses it. Um, but this is, for instance, one thing why Postgres is great. It is open and it is um, easily accessible by anything, regardless of how old it is, because you can just, if, if it wasn't supported, you could make it supported. Um, but anyway, so I, I said we started like 2005. Um, and we went with Power 5, uh, which was current at the time. And uh, Michael already mentioned it. We are using AIX and the Linux operating system. AIX is only used for the application server. We wouldn't use it from, for Postgres. Um, certainly you could, but we as an open source company have way more expertise at Linux. And of course, Postgres has more exposure to Linux, so it is a very good idea uh, to keep it there. And besides, there are no, no real downsides, so um, yeah, this is where we, the way we went. Um, Power has quite a few good reasons to come into existence. One of them is you may want centralized IT infrastructure. That means Power has the ability to provide, or for a long time, um, to provide good virtualization or power virtualization with the LPARs. And um, you can, for instance, have bigger machines in, in, your, in your data center and uh, use them for, for different things, which is normal today. It wasn't 10 years ago. And besides, the virtualization of, of power is pretty cheap. Um, so it is basically one of the very good, one of the good reasons why you want to use it. Talking about Linux, um, we started with SUSE, um, or oh, slash 10 actually. Um, it's, it went well, but we eventually switched to RHEL, um, basically because the support was better for the tools that we needed. Um, I'm not trying to bash on SUSE here. This is, uh, <laughs> their support, of course, was great, but it was about the tools that we needed, for instance, Pacemaker and the whole high availability cluster. Um, so eventually we went to RHEL, and we, have, we don't regret it since. Oh yes, yes. Uh, we will. Yes, yes. We'll come to this in a second. Um, yeah, right. So let's get a bit into detail. Um, we've started using Power since Power Five, as I mentioned. It always adapted to the newer technologies, and currently we are on Power Eight. Um, a fairly big machine. I don't think you know Power. Um, or their, their pricing or their, their models, 
This is an SA24. It is roughly like 100 cores in, in our setup, roughly half a terabyte of RAM. Um, two machines, and uh, right now, running RHEL 7, of course, and Postgres 9.4. Um, the setup, I think we migrated earlier this year, so of course you wouldn't want to go with 9.5 yet. And uh, 9.4 is doing a very well, a good job so far. Um, we have two major databases in play. This is the logistics database and the inventory database. Um, they are ba basically the logistics database is where the customer buys things, right? It stores the products and the customer buys something. Then it is marked and people at the warehouse get informed about this and when they, tra they, they walk, uh, walk, walk by, the system tells them to actually put it into, into the basket and uh, it may or may not get transported to the post office. But it should be. Um, yes, and the machines are, the machines are not co-located, of course. Um, even more so, the, uh, the hosts are not co-located as well. So we have two big databases running on power at the moment, and they try to be on different sides of, uh, uh, of, of uh, our hardware. So one is on the one machine, one is on the other. Um, although we are virtualized, we, or we, are, we are virtualized via LPAR, um, we try not to have everything um, on the running on one host. Of course, there are always buffers, there are always buses that are busy if you have a lot of pressure on one system, so we try to spread it out as early as possible. Uh, we have, th this is of course one of the reasons why we wanna, um, uh, was, was influenced by the problem that we need to guarantee response times. I mentioned that the, uh, the warehouse, for instance, needs to, um, well, the warehouse people uh, walk by and they get informed if something is in their area that you have, they have to pick up. So, of course, if the database is reporting very slowly, they can work very slowly, right? Because they have to, have to wait on each aisle, see if there's something for them, uh, interesting for them. Um, so yes, Postgres try, uh, has to be very, very responsive here. And uh, not just for simple queries, we put the whole business logic or a big parts of the business logic into the database. Um, running PLPG, SQL, um, scripts for various, various occasions. And, but it's, it's working absolutely fine right now. The setup, this is just, this is one of the databases, for instance, one of the hosts. It's, uh, it's, it's a primary and a secondary node on a active passive pacemaker, um, pacemaker setup. We have pacemaker and CoroSync to basically do the, the cluster managing and one primary uh, Postgres server that is, that is accessing the uh, shared storage of, or of the SAN somewhere and uh, is running the database. So we can actually switch the database over to the code standby whenever the pacemaker decides that he has to and can easily uh, fail over. Uh, as you can see over there, we are always trying to be, uh, uh, to, to be able to um, divide the, the load on the machines. So we have these two machines and each time the LPAR uh, of the active node is on the other side than the one of the passive node. This we try to enforce for various reasons, for instance, just, just to keep the average load of the host a little lower. Um, talking about clustering, for database, we decided it's a great idea to use storage-based death, so SBD. Um, this is a poison pill mechanism, actually, where the, the databases always look down onto the storage and um, a daemon decides if he's still connected to this to the storage, what, what the status is, and uh, if he can't reach the storage anymore, this, uh, this SPD device, they will just take the poison pill, as you would say, uh, the host will shut down. Um, this is a great thing for databases because the database just can't work without storage. Uh, so it is the way to ensure that a database just just one database is running. Um, I will come to this later though. We in, in on the, uh, the storage size is roughly half a terabyte per database. 
and we have like 500, uh, like 100 gigabytes of RAM per uh, database at the moment. Yes, so this, this, is, this is the basic setup for both of the machines. You have to take this like twice, uh, two times. Um, actually, the, the uh, image on the left, on the far left, tries to illustrate this. You know, you have one LPAR that, is look, uh, that, that has a standby on the very other one and the same way around. Um, we are heavily utilizing streaming, uh, uh, streaming replication at this point. Um, from the standby, we take, we take the, the, the wall records, store them onto the, uh, store them on another power uh, machine so we can make reports, make backups, make um, whatever we like. It's currently working very well. We still have room for improvement. We have one streaming at the moment. Maybe it'll be more. Uh, we will see about this. Um, backups actually is a very cool thing to take from um, to take from a, from a slave because of course it is a lot of load on the system and you just don't want that all right um, okay so expanding these two these two images uh, these two setups into one image um, you can see we are in in quite the environment we have the uh, logistics department the 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 internal departments like warehouse, like sales and so on, who are accessing all the databases. We have the teleshopping, which is required to get real-time information to display on the, uh, to display on, on the uh, television. Um, we have a backup instance running like one, uh, I think 1.5 terabytes of data at the moment. Where we always try to export uh, unneeded information from the live databases. And uh, on top of that, we have a web shop that is currently running on Oracle Rack. Although I have to say, we will change this soon. Um, this will be an x86 PostgreSQL uh, server. And um, even more logic will be pushed down, downwards into the logistics, uh, into the, yeah, into the logistics database. Um, so it is going to be more important. And actually, I think this is the last Oracle in play at the moment. All right. Um, talking about CoralSync and Pacemaker, we do use uh, we do use uh, RHEL, but we went with our own builds. So we took the Pacemaker and CoralSync ports from CentOS 7 um, for various reasons. One of them is history. The second of them is uh, we needed to build our own SPD devices. And actually, this has been merged upstream at the moment. So if you are using the cluster labs fence agents, they include our uh, SPD, uh, SPD agent and uh, works very well so far. So this is exactly the one you would, so it is, it is proven because it is already working in this very setup. Um, for Postgres, we use the PGDG, uh, PGDG packages, built them our own, uh, built them as well got a few modifications to it. So we're using the power instruction set. Uh, small difference. It is changing things, but to a certain degree. This is, this is not a showstopper or a, or, 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 or a big advantage. It's a few percent, roughly like five to 10, depending. Um, and we're using, and we can't use the LDAP support uh, <laughs> as a great reason. Uh, you've seen the Oracle rec before, and the Oracle FD, FDW, and the LDAP capabilities of Postgres um, just don't work together. There are symbols having the same names because the Oracle FDW has the, uh, already has the, um, the symbols for LDAP because it needs LDAP, uh, so it will it'll break if you use it. And we don't use LDAP on the Postgres side, so we just ensure it is not breaking at this time, uh, which is a pretty good idea for uh, a database and high availability setup. Um, we built our own, so we have a building infrastructure. This is our Jenkins, and um, some of you may know this because this is a Build Farm member called Chop. Uh, he's building for Power8, right? so um, yeah, you will, you will see he won't, he won't f f uh, fail a lot of times, but 
as a build form member. Uh, I think this is pretty normal. Um, you see, we've, we've uh, migrated from Postgres 9.1 to 9.4. Um, we made the switch eventually, I think, uh, earlier this year. We were running 9.1 before. Migrations are always expensive, always take time. So we tried to avoid it a little, uh, waited till 9.4 is mature enough, and so we changed early. Um, yeah, building, Postgres, uh, building Pacemaker as well, but I think you figured. Going into configuration, um, for instance, the logistics database has like 48 cores at the moment. Um, this is half a power machine. As I said, we have like 100 cores, I think 96 to be honest. Um, and 48 go into one logistics database. It's, you will, you'll see a few of the performance metrics later on. Um, it is a little under load sometimes. Huge pages, I believe, I believe huge pages are always a topic if you're, if you're dealing with major machines. Um, we use huge pages, but not the transparent ones. Has a pretty good reason. Transparent huge pages are not slower, but they are in danger of not working. Um, <laughs> because the, the not transparent huge pages, you have to allocate at, at, at boot time, right? So you're guaranteed, so when the system comes up, you get this certain amount of memory that is used for your pages. If you have transparent huge pages, it may happen that if you allocate and deallocate often enough and you have a very fragmented memory, uh, that you can't find enough of a, uh, a, a big enough single point of memory or area of memory that you can actually use for these huge pages. So it, it will fail. Um, so we went for the not transparent ones, has a performance, uh, performance impact, like take it 10% maybe. Um, but that's, that's about it, actually. We do more, of course. We use Tuned. If you know RHEL, you know the Tuned daemon this, that just tries to optimize the system re regarding to certain, uh, to certain, uh, to certain schemas. Uh, for instance, we went for the throughput performance schema that just tries to optimize a few of the, uh, of the schedulers, for instance, I.O. scheduler, CPU scheduler. And uh, we do change the CPU scheduler as well. Um, you may know this. This has been discussed frequently on the on the on the Postgres mailing lists now. Uh, mailing lists. Um, it's just an optimization to make the CPU not migrate a, a process be, uh, before a certain time, which in this case tries to um, tries to translate to how long a normal query takes so the query can run before it's migrated because the, we hope that the process is already gone by that time. Um, yeah, huge, transparent huge pages are not in use. I believe you already figured by what I said before. Going a bit into detail, we have 100 gigabytes of RAM that's big, that it is very big as, as I see it for this database of 500, of 500 uh, gigabytes, but we need to be very cache centric. We need to have those response times so people can work. Um, shared buffers are on like 10%, but I believe you all know how Postgres uh, configuration works. The shared buffers are, should, or, uh, should for, for, for many cases be fed by the uh, file system cache. So, uh, it is sufficient to have, in this case, on like 10% and works very well. Um, maybe you can see, understand the metric. We try to draw the, uh, the, re the hits actually in red and there is a small blue portion. Uh, now and then it is not in the Postgres cache and it has to be cached cache from the, VF, uh, the, the file system cache, but in general it's working. And th there's a big chance that we have 100 gigabytes of RAM, so, so whatever gets, gets, uh, gets pulled from the file system cache, it's most likely already cached somewhere. It doesn't have to be pulled from the storage. Talking about storage, we have to, we have store like 30 gigabytes of raw every day. Um, you, see, you maybe you see, you see the peak at, the, at night, there are some clustering mechanisms, uh, vacuum folds, just to uh, keep things 
a little smoother sometimes. Things fragment even in a database, and sometimes you have these big sequential scans that you just can't get rid of. Uh, it is a good, sometimes it is a good idea to, to cluster. And this is what we actually do. And um, if you know how streaming replication works, if you really cluster or vacuum a whole table, the information need to, need, will be replicated to the slave. Uh, so for us, the slave sometimes lags a little behind because he gets fed like five gigabytes, <laughs> five gigabytes in a few minutes and needs to apply those. It just doesn't work all the time, but it's not, not a big of a problem. Um, talking about load, we have on average like 800 TPS. This doesn't sound too much. If, you, if you're running PG Bench on a regular basis, uh, 500 TPS is something you can achieve on your own. But this is not PG Bench TPS. This is not a single key lookup. This is stored procedures. You know, this is business logic. This is a whole process of someone buying an object. Um, of course, on the holidays around Christmas, people buy more. So it is uh, fair to assume that we have a lot more traffic. Um, one thing maybe to keep in mind, these values are aggregated. So these are like hours or days maybe. So um, there are peaks, there are huge peaks momentarily that the system has to, uh, has to keep up with, but on average um, like 800 or 1500 TPS are the result. System load, I mentioned we have like 50 cores, um, but we, we understand that even if the, the, we need, you need way more cores than your average load um, because we need to report quickly. We need to um, make it work smoothly. Um, so actually we have on, on, singles, on, 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 the, um, on single seconds, we go to loads like 10, 20 maybe. Uh, even higher, depending on what exactly is asked at the moment. Um, but yet we try to, uh, try, well, yet we can answer them always in a few milliseconds. And, yeah, sure. How, how do you define what very good is? What is your baseline or what is your goal on these metrics? Good in terms of uh, query response time. Yeah, what does very good mean? Uh, depends, highly depends. Um, uh, for my understanding, good is everything like 100 to 300 milliseconds, depending on what exactly has been done. And uh, our goal is always to make things as smooth as possible. There has to be, there, there should be no locking. There should be no, uh, no, no data being requ requested from the storage. Things have to go fast. And if if that's uh, the basis for the query for the runtime, um, I believe this is a very good, uh, a very good result. And then again, we have, this, we have this fuzzy demand that things have to go fast. You know, people work on this. There are no machines. This is not the, uh, not the stock market that has to uh, respond to something in like 10 milliseconds. This is, uh, these are people trying to work there. And, uh, you know, they, they don't work faster than like 100 milliseconds. <laughs> they, they need a certain time to react as well. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. There, there were always moments where the system had SORA hiccups. Um, couldn't really point it, point it down to the hardware. It was always something regarding the software, regarding the query, um, maintenance, of course. <laughs> but that's, that's basically about it. It's, we have seen smaller hiccups on the host side already, but they have never been noticed by the, uh, by the client, actually. This was always a pacemaker complaining about things getting a little sharp, um, but the front end was never really touched by this. All right, so going into backups, um, I said we have this streaming setup, the slave, and we take backups from the slave. Now, if you're not familiar with Postgres, you know that uh, taking backups from the slave is a hard thing because the slave cannot synchronize its snapshots. And so you have to do it in a single transaction, uh, which you don't want. 
right? This takes ages. If you have 500 gigabytes and you have to pull them all via one thread, this may take a long time. Um, so what we do is we go to the slave, we can stop it if we like to have a consistent state, but uh, right now we don't have to because we figured it is way more efficient to pull exactly these tables that we need and dump them into the storage. So um, actually this is not a full database backup, it's really just dumping the important information. I believe this is something that is very often enough um, because we could recover from this. If we take, the, take a hit and everything's gone, we could always just take the, the, uh, take the important cues, restore them, and things would be up and running in a few minutes. Um, apart from this, we take snapshots from everything else now and then, but as they don't change and uh, Newer changes are not always required. Um, it, is, it is sufficient to take them on a daily or maybe monthly basis even. Yes, one thing that is about to come is point in time recovery that we are not using right now. Uh, we have the idea that the master will, replicate, uh, will copy his data set into the storage that will then be mounted on the slave, which can recover, which can test the backup and keep it or withdraw it and request a new one, depending on what we want it to. Um, may come soon. Uh, first of all, we have to get the, the Oracle rack, uh, have the Oracle rack gone by then. And uh, then we'll do more on the backups. And uh, I believe this, then we have about everything that we ever wanted. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, the customer is uh, very, gr uh, very grateful about it. It's working fine. Uh, it's a great corporation, to be fair, um, because they know what they're doing. <laughs> so do we. And it's, yeah, it's just, it's just working very well. Because, as I said, there are hiccups sometimes, as in every system, but they've never been, they, they, they never influenced the front end so far, at least to a certain degree not. Right, so I think that's about it. Uh, how is the traffic flow for the front end? Is e-commerce successful and you get more customers? Yeah, Do you the. See this like incremental flow uh, very significant more? Uh, I believe it is. It is statically growing. They are currently expanding to a certain degree, but. Um, wouldn't know because most of the of the load really gets taken by the by the Oracle <coughs> rack at the moment, um, which is which is not very very difficult things. It's just you know there's key value lookups, things that people are trying to, uh, are gathering, and this high of of course scales with the um, not even with how many people buy things, but how people uh, use the the internet, how people. People are looking more into, into websites now than they have been a few years ago. But uh, this doesn't influence the database at all at the moment. It will, maybe, but this information will come once we get got rid of the rack. Right, so any more questions? Otherwise, I think we are done so far.